So then, Adam, what have we got there? Shopping. I have been shopping yet again for the RVF, and this time, it's some new bodywork. Is this, by any chance, the finest Chinesium? Oh, absolutely. You could not get a better Chinese, unless it was on a plate and half dog. The finish looks all right on it, I suppose. But it was incredibly cheap compared to original. So, nose code, well, the full fairing cost me about 300 quid, 310 delivered, which was extremely reasonable because the side panels like that are a couple of hundred quid for one panel. Second hand from Honda. Second hand with slight damage. Of course. Like with chunks missing out of it and stuff, so... And I, I would imagine a nose cone is probably made of pure unobtainium by now as well. There is one on eBay, and it is £500 and needs a bit of work. Brilliant. Right. So, yeah. So, shall we, I suppose, put some of these near a motorbike and see if they sort of fit? Wow, it looks a bit naff without it on. So, let's stick it. I'll make it look like a proper brum brum. Yay! Body work. So we will start at the front, which will be front fender or mudguard if you're English and use language correctly. Front fender? Oh, I was appealing to our American audience. Go and wash your mouth out, so right now. Ooh, look at that. It's, it's very Shiny. red. On the camera, I will admit it looks pink, but in real life, with my actual eyes, it is actually red. So, yeah. Bright red. And it's got go faster holes. Uh, there for your brake lines, sir. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, sorry, did I say the obvious? <laughs> uh, anyway, moving swiftly along. It looks like it sort of fits like that when you're holding it in place, which will be like when it's got the bolts in. What happens when you take the bolt hole, you know, fixings away, as in your fingers? Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's a good job this plastic's slightly flexible. <laughs> I'm sure it'll look fine once we've put the bolts it's in. It's going to look beautiful. Let's put some bolts in it then. Yeah! Of course, to fit the fairing bits to the bike, we will be needing a selection of brackets and bits and the fairing bolts. Now, the bike didn't come with all the fairing on it and what bits of fairing were, were on it weren't really attached properly. So there is a bit of an issue with that. We haven't actually got most of the fairing fasteners. So I have a few spares. Adam has a tub with random junk in it and there is some of the original panels on the floor with the headlights in it and a few little bits but by no means everything we need so adam i suspect will be going shopping and getting a full fairing fastener kit and what we'll have is bolts a bit like this with the shoulder on them because that will sit right in the sort of little cutout in the plastic so when you tighten them up it doesn't push on the plastic and crack the plastic the only slight problem is I only have two of these, and we're probably going to need more than that. But at least today we can actually fit a load of panels and bits, even if we're using the wrong fasteners and putting it on loose and deciding what we actually need. Yes. So that you get to go shopping yet again for more bits for the Honda. Uh, well, it's not the first time. Definitely not the last time. Yes. Bikes, they're brilliant. They're not money pits whatsoever well not all of them are but mostly they are if you buy they one are if in you, bits yes if you buy a bike in individual items off of ebay if you've got money you soon won't have and i might start thinking about selling my kidney you called for some assistance adam what's wrong i didn't call for assistance I was just screaming at uh, a screw in here which will not come undone. Will it not? No. So which screw are you trying to undo? This one. That one down there? Yes. That little screw. That actually screws into plastic, so you'd, you'd think that would struggle to seize up. It, it, it has, because it's not coming undone. Right, OK, so what you need is you need a, like a big boy to come and undo it for you. Yeah, that does look quite tight. I'll give you a hand. Is that screwdriver a good fit? There could be a reason why all this panel's broken. It's because somebody's tried to undo that bolt. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Oh, well, this is getting serious, isn't it? Not sure that'll work very well. I think it'll just 
I think that'll just break the plastic. Well, right then. If I, uh, if you hold the panel, shall I attempt to do the undoing? Uh, no. Should we see the little mole grips will get to it? This is a bit unusual to have to use grips and molies and stuff like that on the fairing fasteners, but uh, desperate times and all that. The only issue is, even if we get hold of it, we may only get about an eighth of a turn on it, but that would be enough, I suspect, to, you know, actually get it moving. Can't do it with that. I'll have a go with these. It's tight, isn't it? It is. That hurt. No. Is it a fudge? It's fine. Tish. Tish? Yes. It's a word spelled backwards. <laughs> it is. <Yes. laughs> So that is one of the bolts that's in one of the other fasteners that we've taken out and it's got this little shoulder on it. So what I need to do is I need to drill it big enough that the head will come off the shoulder. And I'm going to store that in there. And when I measured it, it's six and a half mil. So I have a seven millimeter drill and that should take the head off, but leave the rest of the bolt and then we can just pull the headlight off what's left inside. And then if somebody wants to buy the rest of this broken panel, it's their problem, not mine. make that slightly more fun, the drill had enough tension on it that it's gripped and it spun the brass thing in the fairing panel, which has gone well. So I put that down because now if I drill it, the whole thing just spins around and it turns the brass thing that's in the panel loose. So what we might do is just wiggle that out the hole like that. And as you can see, the little brass thing that sort of grips into the plastic is still on there with the bolt in it but at least now we can put that in the vise and drill it out properly or just get some moldies on it or whatever so that's not too bad and it just means whatever happens with this panel that's already broken and horrible it's just a thing missing out of it brilliant Turns out the little rubber strap that holds the toolbox in is excellent for holding your lollipop while you're building your bike. It's the little things that Honda think of that others don't. The only slight problem is I only know this because fitting the indicators is possibly the most complicated routine you will ever go through. Right, to explain that, we have an indicator and we've taken the screw out of here, which is broken because it's incredibly brittle, and then you slide that out of the way and... Down the back of there, uh, sort of where you can see the light coming through, on and off, down there is supposed to be a little nut sort of bonded to the indicator case. But it's not bonded to the case because it's fallen off because it's 25 years old or whatever. So what we've taken to doing is having it like this, holding the indicator in the right place, feeding the wires through, and then having to hold the nut in place with one hand and feed the bolt through the panel from behind with the other hand to then hold it all together so you can screw it together to then put the front of the indicator back on. It is a little bit awkward and I've never had indicators that were this awkward before. So you know, you lose on the indicator fitment, you win on the lollipop holder. Yin and yang. Adam is busying himself fitting the nose cone. He is also having a similar game with the indicators and there are a couple of other little notes on the quality Chinese nose cone. Firstly, the hole in the front of here is meant to be quite big for a rubber grommet to go through with a bolt with a top hat on so that like the vibration and the tension on it don't crack the fairing. The Chinese didn't do that though. They didn't really mould the hole very well so you can't really fit the rubber thing. Well you probably can but it might not sit very well. So um, they've just drilled a hole through so put a bolt through with a sort of shoulder on it so it's not pulling tension on the plastic but it's not quite as nice and it's not quite in the middle either which is a little bit strange but there you go so that's in the screen bolts 
on the Honda they're little plastic clips and the hole is about three or four mil. Because the holes are drilled out sort of about seven mil on these for normal bolts to go in, you can't use the Honda fairing uh, screen clips. So that's another bit of fun. Adam's thoroughly enjoying himself though, isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. Excellent. Happy faced Adam. So fairing fitting progress so far. We have a nose cone fitted a bit loose. The screen will sort of fit in it, but we're going to have to redraw the holes in it. But it isn't actually an original Honda screen. It is a magical racing screen with Japanese writing on it. So still got a little bit of a prestige to it. Mm. Uh, right. We can't fit the side panels yet because we need some well nuts to go inside them because that's apparently how they're going to attach. This indicator has been glued back together and held on with electrical tape till the glue dries. So we're really hoping that the bulb works in that one. Probably should have tested it first, but never mind. Don't, uh, don't tell the viewer that. This side hasn't got an indicator because this one is really, really not very good. And if I'm going to get really annoying to Adam, um, this one's actually got the drain hole on the top, so that should have been oh, on that side and go. vice versa. Bubble me to the viewer! Bubble me to the viewer! The, the apprentice is kicking off. He will be punished for this later. Right, down to the seat unit, and we are, it, you know, it looks like it's sort of on. We have had to drill that hole out because it was about two mil too small, even though the one that side was absolutely fine. And then we've just got a bolt down here, sort of holding it basically in the right place. And there are a couple of slight fitment issues. Um, if I hold that bit up here so that the bolts sort of line up and Adam holds that bit, there's a bit of a gap. And by a bit of a gap, mm, the oh. Americans would have put Grand in front of it and charged tourists to go look at it. Um, the fitment at the back here is... Even worse, to the extent of it just doesn't fit. Uh, ignoring the fact that the tail light isn't actually fitted, that is, um, you know, it, it's a panel gap issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to get it as good as we can. We're going to leave it on for a couple of days and see if it sort of sorts itself out a bit. It's good quality, this Chinese stuff. There's a reason it's not very expensive. So, the Chinese seat unit is um, it's making progress, but I wouldn't say it's um, factory fit. From here, this doesn't look too bad. So this is probably the best angle, because if we go around here, there is a little bit of a gap, but, you know, I've seen worse. By the time we get the trim panel in here, it might not be too bad. So that's a bonus. There, there is one distinct advantage to having a really big gap here is you can almost not tell that the two whites that they've painted the two side panels in is distinctly different shades. So there's a bonus. So yeah, I think it's fair to say we were not terribly impressed with the fit of the Chinese uh, seat unit. The nose cone is a little better, but we haven't actually tried to attach the side panels to it yet, so fingers crossed for that. Well, that panel gap's looking a little bit better, and even more than that, there's actually some fairing on the bike. So there has been quite a lot of progress. Shall we go and see what Adam thinks to it all? There's been quite a lot of progress on the little Honda, as in the seat unit fits a little bit better, and most of the fairings fitted. Has this been a mere five minutes work? No, about 25 minutes. Didn't well, take that long at all. When I say 25 minutes, I mean 25 minutes a panel. Because nothing really lines up. And the brackets, which we don't have, I had to make some new ones. Uh, but apart from that, it is coming together. Just slowly and not with the best fitment. But hey-ho, it is what it is. That's why it's Chinese. When, yeah. when you say 25 minutes... Being as the seat unit started to actually go on three Saturdays ago. <laughs> yes, but I haven't worked on the seat today, the seat unit. That is true. That was all finished last week. So it only took two days 
to do the seat unit <laughs> on its own. It was quite complicated. I have filed and then put it back together and then taken it apart and then some more filing and then taking it off and did a bit more fire. Yeah, so it was... Uh, time the, consuming. The, yeah, time consuming. There, there was a lot of profanities thrown at it as well. Hence why we didn't record Lots. quite a lot of it, because a man filing plastic and then swearing doesn't make great YouTube content. It, uh, right, so talk us through what you're doing now, because now you're ooh. working down here in the V-piece. So, here's the V-piece. Shiny, that is yeah. minging, but I'm going to get fitment done first. That might be cut out and meshed. Because on the original Honda panels, that wasn't a solid piece with holes badly drilled in it. That was, you know, not there with mesh in it. But of course, that's more operations in China, so they didn't bother. You, you would have thought it would have taken less work for them just to miss out that whole part and just leave it empty then actually figure out how it was all going to get press moulded and all the holes fitted and kind of in line and all the rest when of it. When you say sort of in line, if you hold that straight, that line of holes, that one's higher than that one, and I should like to so say that one's low. They're but not yeah, but yeah, terribly they, in line, no, are they? but they had to make a mould or, or something that that went into and press those holes in, where you could have just left that out and just had a big hole. Which you, yeah, I would have thought would have been, been easier. a lot easier. As we've been fitting the panels, a couple of other slight items have become apparent. If it was a Honda, the inside of the panels would be one colour, not a selection of colours. And we have the right bracket for that side, but not for this side. So Adam's made his own bracket, and he's also had to make the bracket that sits and holds the belly pan under here as well. So the fairing does actually fit pretty much in the right place, and from a distance it looks really quite respectable. It would have been easy if we had the proper bracket, and it would also look a bit nicer if we had the proper plastic trim panels that fit in here, but we don't. And the other thing we're also lacking is all of the seat latch mechanism. We have a lock, which actually actuates slightly in the wrong direction, but we don't have the seat latch or the cable. And you need that to actually hold the pillion pad or the seat cover on. But Fowlers actually have one of these latches in stock. So a brand new one is actually the same price as a second hand one. So we're going to get that ordered. And then we're just going to get the allowed from carrot cycles to make a cable. So before long, it will actually be a usable motorbike. While Adam's away actually earning the money to pay for all the bits of Honda... This seat latch has turned up. This is genuine, brand new from Honda, and it just holds the pillion seat in or the seat cowl in. But there is a bit of an issue, because that bit is available brand new from Honda, because I suspect it fits almost everything from the 90s. And we have a patent lock set, which I've just taken out of the way, but we don't yet have a cable. And that's not the only problem. The lock that goes in here actuates 90 degrees out, which is a bit of a pain, because the cable comes in underneath here somewhere so the cable sort of comes in there so the little swing mechanism under the lock needs to swing that way and currently it swings that way so it wouldn't actually open the latch so i've had to do some modifications so this is the very much not genuine original honda seat latch key and it fits into the seat unit this way up because the little notch goes at the top and it actuates like that but at the moment our cable sort of comes in here, so it would be slack until we got to about there, and that wouldn't be enough to open it. So this needs to be there. So what I've had to do is push the little sort of roll pin out that holds it all together, drill out the notch in here that actually located it, drill a new hole in the top of there, and then I'm going to araldite this onto this shaft and put the roll pin back in up here so that it'll actuate 90 degrees further around and actually pull the cable. So once I've just finished making this, then the only thing we've got to do is make a cable to fit. Seat on. Seat off. Beautiful. So then, Adam, Hello what there. have we got here? Uh, pretty much a finished tank. Being cleaned inside and resealed. 
uh, and the fuel tap has also had a rebuild kit put in it. So it's all coming along swimmingly to the point of the tank can now go on the bike. Woohoo! This is a great celebration because yes. then it can actually run on its own fuel supply and the last little trim bits of bodywork in the seat can go on properly and then potentially it could go for an MOT. Yes. This is getting exciting now because the fuel lines for the actual fuel supply and the little sort of air suction line are connected to the fuel tap. That was the word I was looking for and struggling to find. Adam is just putting the battery terminals on because we uh, have been a few weeks since we've tried to run this thing and thought it was probably best to actually disconnect everything. So once he's done that, we can actually see if the bike will work on its own fuel supply. It is the moment of truth. After many, many, many Saturdays, we are now at a point where we can turn it on and see if it works. Right, uh, you want some choke. There's a little bit of snug down there. Well, right. it was made for Japanese people's fingers, not yours. Right, bearing in mind it has got to fill the carbs up and it's a vacuum fuel pump, so it does take a bit of turning over before it'll start. Well, it had signs hey, of life. It made noise, just not the right noise, but it made some noise, so that's one step closer. Some noise, but not all of the noise. Yeah. Mm. Should yeah, we just press know. the button again and see what happens? Oh, that, that, nearly, that was nearly oh, normal oh, Honda noises. Yeah, choke is fully out. Uh, I wouldn't touch the throttle, because every time you do that, it kills it. Wizzy pop bang! Wizzy pop bang. Yeah, unfortunately that does mean that probably one cylinder is just pumping fuel into the exhaust. Mm. And the fire from the other cylinders is setting fire to it. <laughs> it's cool though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean a running bike would be cooler. <laughs> well, it would be. It would be. It would be the fact that we've actually had it running quite a few times, but not on its own fuel tank, I was kind of hoping it would go, but it has been a few weeks. It's alive! Ish. <laughs> there is some, some life coming out of the end of that pipe. Let's try it. It did it, very, very trying. I will give it that. So I've had the bike running for a couple of minutes now, and if I do the temperature test, that pipe is at 50 degrees. When it was running, it was actually colder than that. That one is at 80 degrees, but when it was running, that one was... 200 ish, and that one was less. 36. But the temperatures sort of fluctuate because they're actually bolted together in a manifold up there. Uh, this one down here uh, is 126. Again, we had that one at around 200. But the one on the other side of the front was fairly cold. So it would appear that this cylinder here isn't running properly, and this one to get a spark plug in it is incredibly easy because we can nearly do it with the fuel tank on. The one at the front on the other side is a pig to get to. So what I'm suggesting is we probably change this one first and see if it gets this cylinder on the go and then move over to the other one later if we're still struggling. Right, so easy access rear spark plug, removed, cleaned, put back in. Yep. Let's have another go and see if we can get three cylinders to work or maybe even four. Ready? Yep. Ignition! <laughs> So now that we've had it running for a, a few minutes and it's sort of warmed through, it's actually not bad at all. Because that's, I'd say, pretty good. The, the only slight issue is... It is a touch smoky, so what we're going to do next is point it so it's out the door 
and run it for a bit and then, you know, condemn it all terribly. Happy? Yeah, boy. You've actually ridden your motorbike. I have. I've ridden my little RPS. And we need to put some preload in that shock because it is uh, soft as you ride it around. But, yeah. you know, nothing we can't manage. So now the bike is looking relatively complete and Adam has even ridden it across the yard, the one thing I noticed as he rode forwards and backwards on it was the back of the bike looks a bit soft. So obviously we've done the rear shock conversion, it's got the S1000RR shock in it with a heavier spring, but we haven't set the preload on it. So that now the trick is going to be that we're going to do some sag measurements. We're going to take a measurement from the rear wheel spindle up to a point on the seat unit, so I'm going to put a, like a little dab of pen or something on there. Then we're going to lift the back of the bike off the floor by rotating it on its side stand. Then I shall measure there, get a full length measurement, and then Adam's going to sit on it and we'll see how saggy he can make it. I'm going to say quite saggy because I am quite weighty. Yeah, I'd go with that. Mm. 440 millimetres. So... So 44 centimetres. Yeah, but we work in millimetres because we're going for accuracy. If um, you would like to sit on your motorcycle, let's see how soft this is. You've got all your weight on it as much as you can? Probably 380. So that's yes. 380 mil, so that's 60 mil of sag. Mm. And what I'd really like to see is 30, 35 mil. We currently have far too much sag, so what Adam needs to do now is get a C-spanner on this lock ring up here and screw that down the shock a little bit and hopefully we can adjust it enough that it puts more preload on the spring to give it less sag. Has the preload been nice and easy to adjust? Yes. A bit like the fairing, it took 20 minutes. Did it? For each little individual little turn... We've done five turns of preload, something like that. Five turns in what? Hour and a half. Mm, maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, minor detail. Yeah. Right, I suppose we ought to do another measure then and see how we're looking. Right then, final measurement. You reckon 35 mil? Yep. I reckon 36. <laughs> whoa, 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 35 mil then. So... I win, which means you have to buy tea tomorrow and bring me more cake. Uh, well, I could probably manage the cake, yeah. No. Right, so we've got 36 mil in the rear, which is in the ballpark. I think it's a reasonably good starting point. We ought to probably really measure the front as well. Right, so we're going to start by taking a full length measurement by rotating the bike over like that. And if I measure it there to there... 135 millimetres. 135. 135. Now gently get on, on your tippy toes to get as much weight on the bike as you can. And that is 106, so that's 29 mil. Yes. And now if you push the bike up and down a little bit, so that you get into the recovered position of the fork, trying to do the whole lot while on tiptoes for extra fun. Happy that's your recovered position? That is 102 millimetres, which gives us an average of 30. 102, what was it, 132? 135. 135, so 33, 29, 32 mil. That's actually about right. So conveniently... I've built the forks absolutely spot on. Uh, <laughs> you, you could make that argument that the forks were built excellently to begin with. Thank you. So that's a pretty good starting point. What we'll do next is I'll do a couple of little push tests on the bike to make sure the valving's somewhere near where it'll work. And then it should actually ride reasonably well. To get the damper set somewhere near, what we're going to do is I'm just going to do some pushing up and down on it and see how it feels. You know, it's all terribly technical. And actually, the front of the bike actually feels pretty good. It goes down and comes back at 
a sort of similar rate. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to wind the adjusters all the way in and show what difference that makes. We only have rebound adjustment on these forks, but it does actually affect a little bit the compression as well. Half, one, one and a quarter. So that's the adjusters wound all the way in. And as is standard with a lot of things in the 90s, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, they do make a little bit of a difference though, and there is, it is a little bit slower coming back than it is going down. So I think what we'll do is we'll go back out to a turn and a half, and we'll be pretty good. I'd say that looks pretty good. It feels quite nice. It goes up and down relatively easily, but these bikes are not big and heavy, so you actually want the suspension reasonably soft because it's not putting tons and tons of force through the bike like you would say on a new 1000cc bike, so that's pretty good. So the next thing to do is the back. At the back of the bike, what I'd like it to do is feel pretty much like the front of the bike. So what I'm going to do is push it down and see how quickly it recovers. Bearing in mind that this shock isn't for this bike, this is where we find out if it's actually any good or not. Right, it certainly doesn't feel too bad. It doesn't collapse and not come back. It doesn't spring back uncontrolled, so it's not too bad at all. So what I'm going to do again with this is I'm going to wind the rebound adjuster all the way in, see what difference that makes. Right, the rebound adjuster is at the bottom of the shock, but it does affect the compression a little bit as well. So. That is definitely slower coming back. So I don't want it that slow. I want it to come back a little bit quicker. So I'm just going to take a little bit of that rebound back out. But we are nearer the closed section than we are the open section of the shock. But then again, with a stiff spring on it, it was always going to be a bit like that. Right, I'm happy that that feels pretty good, but I am going to have a little play with the compression adjuster. Because we've got one, we may as well have a little play with it. Conveniently, the compression adjuster is hidden behind the subframe rail, so it is a little bit awkward to get to because it's at the top of the shock. But I have been able to wind it all the way in, and now we'll see if that makes any real difference. Yes, that is distinctly firmer to push on. So I might argue a little bit too firm, so I'm going to take a couple of clicks back off that, see if it feels alright. So the front goes up and down relatively easily, the back goes down and up relatively easily. So I reckon that's a pretty good starting point for when Adam's out on the road. Now we have suspension set up, a bike that actually runs, I suppose that it's down to the finer details of what's needed before its MOT. Uh, one thing that will be definitely be needed is a number plate, because that is not attached yet. Uh, we need to put some bar end plugs in here. And that's... Oh, new cam. Ah, uh, yeah, and Paula A16 is making us a new silencer, which yes. will look a bit better. And on that note, uh, this one, which is hideous, now doesn't point into the bike like it used to. It sort of runs parallel down there because we got a piece of uh, big pole earlier and we pulled the pipe work a bit straighter. Yep, I got my big boy muscles out and gave it a bit of a wrench in. Thanks. So that's it. Next stage is for an MOT. Thanks for watching and join us again next time when we get the RVF on the road.